Good morning. Okay, is that running? Okay. Well, believe it or not, we're not into summer yet. Which is, uh, that in itself is, is an interesting revelation. I can't remember when it starts. My calendar doesn't have it on it. I guess it's 20th? Yeah, next week. Yeah. So it's it, that's interesting because within uh, Buddhism in general, the summer training period is looked at from uh, April to July. So it's a little bit different. Of course, everybody's calendar is a little bit different when we look at it. <clears throat> And today I want to talk a little, a little about koans. We, we don't talk about koans here. Occasionally they accidentally come up. But um, I always say, and you've probably heard me say it, that if, if in doubt, if I'm not really sure how valid something is or orthodox something is, I go back to the Pali Sutras and uh, look to see what the Buddha thought about things. So, the first thing to say about koans is they haven't been around the entire time that we practice Buddhism. And uh, they, they really came into uh, prominence around the time that we say Bodhidharma arrived from China, or China, from India, and uh, had his encounter with Emperor Wu. And you could, you could pretty well say that Bodhidharma made a public case, and that's what koan means, it's a public case. Um, interpret that as you will. When he went to see Emperor Wu, when he came in front of Emperor Wu, and uh, Emperor, now Emperor had, Bodhidharma, I get to collect my thoughts, Bodhidharma arrived from India on a boat. There were two ways to get to China. One was on a boat, which was the most dangerous way because it's estimated that half of the boat sunk. Uh, and they were uh, Chinese uh, boats, which were, what did they call those, junks? And they, they, they really weren't much of a boat. They, they weren't very stable on the open ocean. They were, they were okay staying close to shore and things like that, but out on the old ocean, uh, they, they weren't so good. And uh, he arrived that way and the emperor heard that a, a great monk, an important monk, a great master, somebody that he probably wanted to talk to had arrived. Now, he came in the 8th century. Buddhism arrived in China, I, and you know, every time I, I gave a, give a date, I think I need to get a book out. There's lots of things I need to do, <coughs> but I need to get a book out. And, and write down all these different dates so that I remember them accurately. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, don't mislead you when I say things, you know. And it's just like the names of things. I, I should be writing them down so that I don't say them wrong to you because you'll go away and get in an argument with somebody and say, well, Roshi said this. And somebody will say, well, Roshi could be wrong and you'll, you'll start a fight. Oh no, I'll hit you in the nose if you say that again. And it's all not worth it. But <laughs> Buddhism arrived in the first century, uh, you know, zero, zero. And uh, they came over through the desert and through all the different stands Pakistan's and Jerkistan and all those things. And uh, there, it was the Silk Road. That's, that's how they got to China. 
because there was this long route. They, they call it a road. I, I don't think all of it was really a road. But the, the road went from China all the way up to Jerusalem and to the Greeks. And so if you've uh, ever attempted to be an amateur scholar and you're trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, how did this, how did they get to there to get to this idea to come up with this custom, you know, uh, scholars, real scholars, have held the idea for a very long time that monotheism was imported from uh, India because the Indians considered themselves monotheists. Now, if you have a hard time wrapping your head around that, that's okay. It's all right. Uh, if you learn to just breathe and relax, you might be able to understand it. Uh, it's really not any different than Christians having uh, the three facets of God. You know, it's really the same thing, just in a more spectacular version. And so Buddhism had arrived and was well. And to, to get it in perspective, which is what we always need to do, is that Bodhidharma arrives, in, uh, like I say, in the 8th century, and Buddhism had been there, oh, 700 years. Okay, how long has Buddhism been in America? You know, think about that. Well, again, if I had my doggone notebook that I'm too lazy to start, I would have a date down on there, and the date would be something like 1891, and it was when the, we had the Congress of Religions. Is anything being picked up? Probably not very well. What do we got going there? Probably not very well. Oh, look, look at that. Oh, what a deal. Somebody who came on YouTube who's already decided that it's a waste of time to listen to this talk will miss out on all the good stuff. And um, so Buddhism arrived here and, and we, we say it was, it was around, I believe it was around 1890, 1891, 1892. It was the World Congress of Religions. And a Japanese monk had come and come from Japan, spoke no English at all. Everything had to be translated. He gave a talk, and uh, that talk is available. Uh, his name was Shoen Chaku, and if uh, you go to our library, if you if you're here, you can. He's got he's got some good talks in there, and I think the title of the book is Talks by a Buddhist Abbot. And um, I believe that talk that he gave is in there. Everything had to be translated. He never did learn English, but he had uh, he had a couple famous students. Nyogen Sasaki was one of them. Uh, who, if you look at, look way back in history, you'll see him. And the other one was Daisen Suzuki, who wrote many, 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 many essays and books on Zen. All of them will give you a headache to try to understand what he's saying, but, but uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant man. And um, they, he was a lay student. Uh, so all of that was, well, let's see, it's 22, about 130 years ago. So why do I mention that? Well, think about the complexion of America. Of course, America, I used to think America was totally and completely unique in the, the variety of religion it had. And then I started studying a little bit of history and found out that all we were doing was kind of emulating what England had already started. You know, if you take the United Kingdom, if you include Scotland and Ireland and all this, 
you get all of this variety within Christianity, even though you would think it would be very, very one way. It, 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 of course, it wasn't. Because while the Catholics and the Church of England were fighting, we had Methodists. And we, we, you know, we, we had all these people in there. Many of them left England because uh, they weren't supported, but the thing was they were there. Today, in this wonderful country of ours, land of the freedom, we have over 300 denominations of the Protestant belief. Well, if you don't think we have freedom of religion, just to go home and sleep on that one, over 300 versions, everything from what I consider very orthodox, like Lutherans and Methodists and Baptists. Yes, Baptists are actually orthodox. They were Anabaptists when they came to this country. And, uh, they were called pilgrims when they stepped off the boat. But then, of course, we have Bob's Church of the Holy Rose. There's only one of them, and Bob's doing a good job of being the minister. And every once in a while, the people get upset with him, and they go down the street, and then they have, they have Johnny's Church of the Holy Daisy, and then they get upset with each other, and they split again, and they keep opening up churches and storefronts, and, but things like this. So, but Christianity or Buddhism in this country is is a little over a hundred years old, and yet every time I go traveling, the first thing I do now phone books have pretty well disappeared, so I don't know what I'm going to do. But I used to get the phone book out and I would look up Buddhist to see if there was any Buddhist temples in the town. I wouldn't go there. I was just curious if, if Buddhism had gone there. And um, it's like the, I was in Phoenix and I was taking some training back when I was working as a, as a high school teacher. And I was back there for some teacher training for a week. And I got the phone book up and sure enough, there were three Vietnamese temples and a Theravada temple in the beautiful town of Phoenix, and we're talking 25 years ago. And they're all over the place. Now, are they a predominant religion? Well, no, of course not. But they're, they're all across America. And, uh, you know, they're, when I started going up to Washington, Oregon area, I was amazed to find out that there's a huge enclave of Tibetan monks and people that follow that kind of Buddhism. And so they're everywhere. And the largest school, of course, is Zen. And, and, I, and I've said that all along. And I, I didn't realize how, how large a presence there was of, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which is another school, like Zen is, and uh, it's big there, but it's not particularly big in the high desert, you know. Uh, they used to sell handbells over at the indoor swap meet. That was about as close as they came to having Tibetan Buddhism here. But if you go into these uh, Zen places, you're going to find out that 99 out of 100 are Soto Zen coming out of Japan. And the other 1% is Renzai Zen. And both of them use koans to a certain extent. So what the heck is a koan? A koan is a problem. And it's a problem you've got to solve as a student. Now, it's, you know, in China it's called a kongan, in Japan it's called a koan. But it is really a problem to be solved. And uh, one of the most common koans that your teacher might give you. By the way, somebody has to give you a koan because uh, we're a little insecure as human beings and we realize that if we go to study a problem and we don't have anybody to tell us if the answer is right, we might stop trying to solve the problem because what's the point? You could just one day announce to everybody, well, you know, I was reading the gateless gate. And 
Upon reading the gateless gate, I solved all the koans in that collection. And someone says to you, how do you know that? Well, because I solved all the koans in that collection. The sky opened up, clouds moved about, thunder and bells were sounding, and I know that I am a fully enlightened being. Of course, if a teacher walks through the room, he reaches over and slaps you on the side of the head, and reality returns. So, what, what is a koan? A koan is a problem for a student to answer, and the student has to try really hard to answer it. And here's one koan. Who is the Buddha? That's a good koan. Who is the Buddha? As I thought about today and what I was going to talk about, I was going to talk about a very popular koan in Vietnam. And it's, who is the Buddha? And uh, they don't use, well, you can't make statements like that. They, who's they? Every teacher in Vietnam does not use all the koans that exist. Some of them simply use some of the koans because Vietnamese Buddhism is distinctly different, or Zen is distinctly different than every other form of Zen because they will use any technique that works. This is not so in Soto. There are iconoclastic Soto monks who will tell you that uh, Soto has absolutely nothing to do with koans. The koans are, they belong to the Rinzai school. And in the Rinzai school, they give a great shout and they solve koans. In the Soto school, we sit quietly in tranquility and enlightenment slowly develops within us until one day we're awake. And maybe even our teacher knows it and says to us, ah, awake, <laughs> you're awake now. That's all very interesting because the great master Dogen, who went to China in the 13th century and studied with a great master there, when he was, his awakening was recognized, the master gave him some things. He gave him a little certificate that said, you're awake, and gave him a really nice picture of him. Now remember, they didn't have cameras, so the picture had to be painted. And gave him these things to bring back as souvenirs from his time in China studying with Ji Qing. And, <laughs> and for the week before he left, he was up every night copying a collection of koans. And he brought them back. He brought the gateless gate back to Japan and started teaching people how to do meditation, primarily girls, by the way. He was, without a doubt, uh, a non-traditional guy. He did not teach women how to do meditation because there was no point, because they couldn't become awakened. Dogen came back and started teaching women and wrote a, three, different, three different sets of instructions on how to practice meditation. And he had these koans. So in, if you were in Vietnam and you went to stay for maybe a year or two in a temple there, the master might call you in. Now this is always a private experience. It doesn't matter the culture that it's in. He'll go into a private place. It could be his room that he sleeps in. It could be a shed out back. It could be a spot underneath a tree that everybody had to stay away from. And you would talk with the teacher about your understanding of Buddhism and your understanding of Zen. And you might say to the teacher after a year, what is Buddhism? Because the teacher said to you, what is Buddha? 
or who is Buddha, or where is Buddha? You can ask that question another way, and you might go back to the teacher and see if you can trip him up and say, what is Buddhism? The teacher would immediately answer and say, the plum tree in the garden. Now, it may be given to you as a koan. You may go to sit, sit you know, uh, talk to your teacher about your practice, and the teacher say, okay, I want to tell you about this monk that went to his master, and he asked the master, what is Buddhism? And the master replied, the plum tree in the garden. Koans are presented that way. And the teacher says to you, now, what did he mean? What does that actually mean? It is one of the best koans that was ever devised, the plum tree in the garden. Our, our plum trees, by the way, are bearing fruit. And if you don't understand the koan, go look at the plum tree. You know where they are. They're back behind the song hall. We have two of them that are prolific. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you some leading questions to help you understand the koan. Because you have to know and be the answer. A student of mine years ago, unfortunately, he had a heart attack and we lost him. But he, and he was much younger than me. He, uh, he showed up one day and he had a book and he was so proud of himself. And I think, the, I think the book's in the library. I may have hidden the book. It's called The Answer to All Koans. And within that book, you can look up what the appropriate answer is. And I was a little discouraged at one time when I was very, very young. I just had a birthday, by the way, yesterday. If you didn't know, I think you knew. And now I'm, I can't say I'm very, very young anymore. I just say I'm young. <laughs> Mom sent me a text and said, young man, call me a young man. I, I like that. And uh, the question becomes, if, if I tell you the answer, do you know the answer? So if you were to ask me, who is Buddha? If you were to pose the question to me, who is Buddha? I'd go, you. Now do you know the answer? No. No, you don't know the answer. I wish you did. I wish it was that simple. You know, uh, we, we're coming out of a period, I think, I think we're coming out of it. Uh, you know, th this country has been divided as political parties. For It was divided for four years people had learned how to hate their neighbor. And this one knows what I'm talking about because he was in that wagon. And they learned how to hate their neighbor because of their politics. They didn't hate their neighbor because of the job they worked at or how they treated their children or how they, how, how they raised their family or how they functioned in society. You know, maybe they went down and volunteered at the Oh, the Boys and Girls Club every Saturday. No, they didn't hate each other because of that. They hated each other because of their politics. And we've almost always had two different opinions about the way things should be done. Hell, we probably had 100 or 300 opinions on the way things should be done. But if you distill it down into a political party, theoretically we had two big groups who for four years really learned how to hate each other. I have to say that I think Biden, as you know, when he when he took office, he said he was going to calm the waters. Uh, he was going to return things to a more civilized state, whatever you want to say. <laughs> and I think, I think, but as by his ineptitude, he's doing it. He's not doing anything that's making anybody mad. Well, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. He has, yes. If, if you were in the service, he's done some things that make people mad, but, oh, you don't, you don't hear the hate talk anymore. Think about it. When's the last time we had a riot because we hate people that don't agree with us? And that's all it is. We hated people that didn't agree with us. And, of course, we're always right, so they're, they've got to... They've got to be wrong if they disagree with us. So I hadn't even thought of that until I mentioned it, but yeah, he seems to have pulled it off just by not hating other people. He's setting a good example. He, uh, but but if we could just say that everybody is entitled to have an opinion, and you may or may not know whether you're right or wrong, and people would accept that, that'd be great. Just as if I said, you're Buddha, you can have Buddha nature. If you just let go, you'll realize you're already enlightened. There's, or I said, there's nothing to be gained, and, and you actually knew that, we'd be done. Except it took the Buddha seven years to figure out the answer to his koan. And when we talk about koans, there's a center down in L.A., and I mention them all the time because it's kind of fantastical. I don't have anybody here that knows the right answer to my question. The answer is how many... But the question is, how many koans did they do? And they do um, three different sets of koans, and I think it's close to 700. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's astronomical. No, it's not that big. It's not 700. Uh, they do the, the Gateless Gate, which is 50, and they do the, the Book of Serenity, which is 100, and they do... Um, can't think of the other one. So they, they do about 270. I think that's what it is. And so the, 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 the bottom line is, how many times can you be asked who you are? And how many times can you reply Buddha before you believe it? And when I had some people that came here and studied with me for a while, and they described what happened at that center, that uh, people would go in and they couldn't, they, they couldn't solve the koan, so the teacher would tell them what the answer was. I told you what the answer was. What is Buddha, the plum tree in the garden? Do I need to tell you what that means? Probably. Will you be enlightened after I tell you what that means, the plum tree in the garden? We'll let our notice monk put the incense burner back on the altar so that he can respond to my question. I've told you that the answer to what is Buddha or who is Buddha is the plum tree in the garden. What does that mean? You have to speak up now so that the oh, okay. people um, on the recording can hear you. I would think in a simple way, simply is. Simple way simply is. It's, it's the Buddha simply is. Just like the plum tree simply is. Well, that's a good answer. It's absolutely right. Now, the question is not whether you believe that. The question is whether you live that. Okay? Come back when you live it. Because the answers to koans are almost all the same answer. But you actually have to be that answer. So that center down in L.A., what they're doing is they're encouraging people that are coming. And everybody works koans there. All you've got to do is pay your membership dues. They, they do. They're typical Japanese. You become a member of a temple and you support the temple with a little money every month. 
and you can go in and you can talk to one of the teachers. They have many there. You can have your favorite, you know, that you bond with, and you go in and he says, okay, you have a call. What's your call on? You have to tell them. They, too many, too many students, so you have to remind them. And sometimes they're like me. They're working on being old and they can't remember what koan they gave you. So you, you, instead of saying, well, Master, do you remember? You just go, you, my koan is. And then, then the Master would go, I gave him that koan? Why did I do that? And so almost all the koans end up being the, the same thing. It's all back to, are you just you? Are you doing that? Are you, have you stopped trying to be somebody else? Have you stopped trying to be important? And just add all of that in. Nobody needs to be any more important than they already are. Okay, nobody needs to be somebody different. You are as perfect as you can possibly be right now. Now, you may be deluded. And if you're deluded, you don't know that, so that you go around and you think that other people can be wrong. You, you really do. That's what we're coming out of. We're coming out of this period where everybody thinks that the, if the other person doesn't agree with them, they're wrong. It doesn't matter what they believe. It's, they're, they're wrong. They, they don't agree with me. And when you realize that everybody's right, You're right, and the person that disagrees with you right. You know, one of the most powerful things I ever learned, to give you one little tiny example. I, I, my first year of college, I took public speaking. I walked in, and I had, it was interesting. There were two required classes to school I went to. One was public speaking. It was felt that a college-educated person should be able to emote. How often do you get to use that word? I don't think I've ever used it before. <laughs> and you need to be able to write. And so you had to take a class on essay writing. And if you couldn't write a good essay, they kicked you out of the class. You had to go back and take another English class and then come back again. And the, the two teachers that had been hired knew each other. They had just graduated and they had degrees in linguistics. They didn't have English degrees. They had degrees in the meaning and the source and the, all of that of the history of words. And so I go on a public speaking the first day and this guy stands up and I've never forgot it because he said, 90% of all disagreements are verbal disagreements. And I'm at a community college. I'm 25 years old, and the average age in there was 19. Now, come on. When you're 18 or 19 or 20, don't you know the answer to every question? Yeah, you haven't, you haven't fulfilled the prophecy of Mark Twain yet. You know, where he said, when I was 14, I was amazed at how stupid my father was, and when I was 24, I was amazed at how much he'd learned. Yeah. <laughs> And so you're sitting there and you think you know the answer to every question, and if you don't, you'll come up with one. And he said, it's a verbal disagreement. And nobody knew what he meant. I didn't know what he meant. What's a verbal disagreement? It means you really don't understand what the person's saying. It means that a husband and a wife can be saying exactly the same thing in a different way. And they're having an argument, and they're getting madder and madder and matter because they think they disagree and they don't actually disagree. The disagreement is only verbal. They're using words differently. They understand what words mean slightly differently. And so there's this disagreement, disagreement going on. He said, you know, nine times out of ten. He said most people that get in arguments don't really disagree. They just don't listen very well. They don't understand what the other person is saying. 
And think about that. When, when does somebody start to say something that you said, oh, and you started forming what you were going to reply, what you were going to say as soon as they gave you a chance. You're waiting for them to take a breath so you can jump in and tell them they're wrong instead of just listening. So what is enlightenment? Listening. Paying attention. Not always thinking you're right. You don't have to think you're wrong. Just get rid of this, this thing in your head where you always have to know the right answer. If you stop talking to yourself and listen, my first teacher used to say that, we're the animal that talks to herself. We're always running a dialogue in our head. Somebody starts to explain something and we're in our head, we're, too, we're, we're remembering, you know, we're figuring out why they're wrong. Oh no, that's not that way. Oh no, I don't agree with you that. Okay, shut up now so that I can tell you you're wrong. That's not the enlightened mind. The enlightened mind just listens. The enlightened mind just speaks. The enlightened mind is, just is. That is what it is. But you, you have to live that. You can say it all day long, but if you don't live it, then it's not real yet. And you'll know that because, are you unhappy? If you're unhappy, you're not enlightened. <laughs> unhappy is not part of the enlightenment formula. You know, well, I wish things would change. They will. How long have you lived? We got a couple of people that have been around. Monica's been around a long time. Fo Men's been around a long time. These two have been around. Eh, but they've been around a long time. What happens if you wait? Things change. Right? They're going to. They cannot stay the same. They are going to change. So if you don't like, if you don't like the way the tree looks today, check it out tomorrow. Tom Mung, the most venerable Tom Mung, got so excited when the trees we planted on the walkway to where he lives started putting out leaves. He got so excited. Well, one, it means they're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But the other is, they were alive. We got two things going on there. They were alive. That's the enlightened mind. Everybody experiences enlightenment. It's just that sometimes after they experience enlightenment, they get deluded again. The trick is just to stay in that place of wonderment.